Hey everyone, so we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to share our screen. We have a slide deck to go through this evening. Now this class is going to be very, very basic. I'm looking at some of your worst bike repair malfunctions and I'm going to say a couple of those are probably um, beyond what we're going to cover in this class, but we will try to give you some resources of where to go to learn how to identify potential problems or to fix them. Uh, but this, this is a really basic class. All right, let's get started here. I'll let people in as they continue to come in a few minutes late. So uh, my name is Rich Conroy. I'm the director of education at Bike New York. Um, I am kind of a self-taught mechanic. I started working on my own bike as a middle school kid. I had a banana seat bike with high riser bars and uh, it was a hand-me-down bike from an older sibling. And I, as a kid, liked to take things apart and put them back together. And uh, I think my bike's rear hub was wearing out. And so I took it apart to see what I could do. And it was one of those coaster brake hubs. So it had a few moving parts inside of it. And we didn't have grease at our house. Um, so I thought salad oil might be an appropriate lubricant for my single speed coaster brake hub. Turns out that was wrong. It was totally inappropriate, way too light. And, um, and it, it just, the bike got worse and worse. I had been mowing lawns and babysitting to try to earn money for uh, a road bike. I wanted a bike with gears. And luckily at the age of, when I turned 13, I think my mom had mercy on me and bought me a fairly nice road bike uh, as a 13th birthday present. Uh, I've worked as a mechanic for Metro Bicycles in New York City, that chain no longer exists. They were bought by Danny's and now most of the New York City Metro stores are now owned by Trek. But I once worked as a salesperson and also as a mechanic in Metro shops, uh, mainly out in Queens. Uh, and then I taught uh, a bike mechanics program in a middle school in Inwood and Washington Heights uh, for Recycle a Bicycle before I was hired to start Bike New York's education program. I built nearly all of my own bikes from the frame up over the years. I bought and sold a number of frames and I have a kind of a fleet of bikes in my apartment. Um, so I have a lot of mechanical experience, but what I've learned is just taking care of very basic stuff will solve most of your um, bike maintenance problems. All right, a little bit about Bike New York. Uh, we are a local New York City-based nonprofit organization that uh, promotes cycling and getting more people on more bikes more of the time in New York City. Um, our main claim to fame, the thing that people know us best about is our five borough bike tour, which the first, first tour was something like 1977. It was a tour of high school students. And then it grew to a general public tour and that tour funds all of our programs, including mainly our bike education program. So I'd like to think that people would know us more about our bike education program, but that's not the case. Um, nonetheless, the program has grown quite a bit over the last few years uh, to the point where we were reaching about 24,000, 25,000 people per year with classes and programming, not handing them you know, safety cards, but actual classes like this one. Uh, we were able to get bicycle education into the New York City public schools during the school day, uh, which is a huge accomplishment. In New York City bureaucracies may not be the easiest to work with, and it took years for us 
to convince Department of Education in New York City that this is what they should be doing um, to promote health and physical activity among their students. Okay, let's move on. Here's what we're gonna do tonight. Most of what we're gonna cover doesn't even involve using tools. You will need a few items and we'll, we'll talk about which items you need, uh, but these are fairly basic things. At the end of this, since some of you have had some other kinds of meltdowns uh, with your bike, we'll talk about some other resources. And if I forget to do that, please remind me. I do have everybody on mute because some people are doing dishes, some people have children, some people have the TV going, some people have jackhammers. And so uh, we don't want all that background noise to um, disrupt the class. If you do have a question or comment, you can put that in chat. And then at the end of the class, I will give you the option to unmute yourself to ask verbal questions. Anyway, we're gonna talk about uh, some bike maintenance, not necessarily repair, but maintenance jobs that will make your riding easier and less trouble-free. And when I say easier, I mean less physically demanding uh, in terms of your own pedaling and physical effort. Uh, so that is inflating your tires, how to do that, how to clean and lubricate your chain, uh, how to adjust and lubricate the cables that operate your brakes and derailers, and then Along the way, we'll talk about any tools and supplies you need for that stuff, for those little, little jobs. And most of these jobs are jobs that can be done in just a few minutes. All right, let's talk about inflating tires. So I noticed that a couple people, one person in chat said they had two flat tires on a trip. I had about 12 flat tires. I was on a bike tour with my girlfriend and I usually have pretty good flat tire karma but that karma abandoned me in a trip uh, several years ago. And I got 12 flat tires in the space of maybe three days. And it was so bad, my pump actually broke from so much pumping up of tires and tubes. Uh, turns out the tires looked okay, but they, they were getting old. Um, more recently, she and I were on a bike tour of New York State and I got two flat tires our first morning uh, in, well, we went to Burlington, which is not New York State. I was like, I am not doing this again and putting my sweetheart through this kind of flat tire drama. So we visited a shop and found two good tires. Anyway, I had had my tires pumped up. They, they were still getting flat. So the reason why you want to keep your tires inflated generally speaking, is that it will uh, make you work less hard to pedal your bike forward and you'll have less of a chance of uh, catching a flat tire, particularly what's called a pinch flat, when your very soft tire hits an obstruction like a pothole or a curb edge or you know some hard obstruction and then tube inside the tire gets pinched between the tire and the tube, uh, which can happen if you're riding on tires that are soft. Uh, probably it also saves wear and tear on your tires. So what are you going to need? You're going to need a pump, obviously, and you're going to do most of your inflating at home routinely, probably about once a week. We also recommend keeping a pump on your bike uh, just for the guy who got two flat tires in one ride so that you will have a pump to replace tubes and, um, you know, fix those flat tires. But that little pump that you take with you on a ride, really, that's for emergencies. It's not, it's not going to hold up for routine day-to-day -day inflation. Uh, what I recommend is getting a pump with a gauge on it that you can read easily. Most pumps these days come with gauges. There are two basic types of valves. There are more than two, but the types you're most likely to see are Presta 
and Schrader. So Schrader is the same type of valve that cars and trucks and kids' bikes have on them, and they're pretty common. Presta, uh, you'll get with slightly higher end bikes. Once you start going above five, six hundred dollars for a bike, you're probably going to start getting into Presta tubes. Uh, so your that means your pump head needs to accommodate uh, one or both sizes. Uh, this is not a very good picture here, but this pump head here has a narrower hole for Presta and a wider hole for Schrader. If you, if your pump only has um, the wider kind, the Schrader, you can buy an adapter, it's like a buck, couple bucks at a bike shop that will fit down on the Presta valve, but the top of it's wide enough for your Schrader pump. And then if your pump doesn't have a gauge, you're gonna need a high pressure gauge. I would not go to AutoZone for that because car gauges, you know, car tires only really need to go up to 32 pounds or so. And that's minimum for a bike. So any bike like mountain bike, road bike, you're gonna need a pump that goes over 30 to 40 pounds of pressure. So make sure you do that, get that at a bike shop or a retailer that sells tools for bike parts. So there's likely to be a little plastic cap on your valve stem and you can just take that off. All that is, is a kind of a dust cover to keep the mechanical parts of your valve clean. With the Schrader, once you get that off, you don't really need to do anything else with the valve. But with the press stem, there's another little part you just need to unscrew. You can't remove it, but you have to unscrew it because when it's screwed all the way down here, you can't get air into that valve. So you have to unscrew it. And then I usually give it a little tap in case it's stuck from moisture or anything inside the tube. You're also gonna wanna know what the pressure rating on your tire is. Um, and that can be a little bit hard to read, but it might say inflate two, maximum pressure. It will might have a bunch of numbers. Make sure you're not reading the numbers for the size of the tire. Like don't inflate your tire to 700 pounds. So um, it will say PSI, inflate two, maximum pressure, and it'll give you usually a range. So for a mountain bike, it's like, 40 to 65 for a hybrid, you know, 40 to 80, 40 to 90. For a road bike, anywhere from 80 to 120, 150 even sometimes, pounds of pressure. If you do have a Presta adapter and that's what you need to use, make sure you unscrew that little part of the Presta valve that I identified and then you're gonna screw the Presta adapter down onto the valve. Then you're going to put your uh, pump head, which is at the end of the hose, down onto the valve, and you're gonna to wanna to lock the lever into place. And that's gonna vary depending on the type of pump that you have. So my pump is a pretty old z -Fold from France, it's like, 40 years old, things bomb proof. Um, and I have to lock the pump head in place by pushing down on the lever so it's parallel with the hose here. But other levers, let me go back to pumps here. This common pump head from Toe Peak, you push the valve, this lever sideways away from the valve, away from the wheel. And then this one, I forget that who makes this, maybe also toe peak. You flip the lever up, which means it's opposite of the way my, my valve head works. If you don't lock the valve in place, uh, it's just gonna like blow air out of, the, out of the valve head. It won't, it needs an airtight seal here. 
uh, before it's going to put air in your tube. So um, if your tire gives you a range, like a mountain bike tire, maybe 40 to 65 pounds, you should get your pressure somewhere in that range. Uh, and you can do that according to your preference. Higher pressure means uh, there will be less rolling resistance because less of the tires contacting the surface that you're riding on. Uh, but higher pressure may not be good for something like a mountain bike because uh, maybe you need more contact with the surface, especially if the surface is like gravel or it's loose or it's rocky. Uh, I'm also going to say during the winter time, slightly more of your tire contacting slick pavement or snowy pavement is probably better in terms of traction. Uh, also lower, slightly lower pressure is better for shock absorption. Like I have generally road bikes and if I max the tires out on those road bikes, sure I can go fast, but then every little bump is getting transmitted through the tire right up to my 55 year old body, which is deciding it doesn't like that so much anymore. Uh, so I go on the lower end, maybe 90, 95 pounds of pressure for a road bike tire. And I feel like it takes the edge off and I'm still fast enough. I'm not gonna win any races and not that I'm even trying. So when you're done, uh, remove the valve head, you know, the pump from the valve. Uh, you have to flip up that locking lever. It'll make a little psh of noise as it's letting uh, air actually out of the hose, not out of the tube. And uh, if it's a Presta valve, you want to remove that Presta adapter and close the valve by screwing it back down, which you have to watch out that you're not pushing down on that little, little valve pin as you're screwing it back in. And then it's a good idea, it's not critical, but it's a good idea to put the dust caps back on. If you don't ride often, like less than once a week, uh, it's a good idea to check the tires every time. So you can use your gauge or you can use your, your hands, your fingers. And what I do is just give the tire a good hard squeeze. And if it has enough air, it should be rock hard. If you feel any cush or sponginess to it at all, get that pump out and, and replace those tires. Uh, if if you're using the same bike every day, five days a week, seven days a week, you're probably gonna need to reinflate uh, once a week. There are people I know who ride road bikes that say they can feel a difference in 24 hours and they pump their tires up every day. Uh, that's fine, I sort of feel that's, that's a, little, a little sensitive, but um, if somebody wants to do that, that's fine. Okay, let's talk about your next job. This will be a little bit more messy maybe than um, pumping up your tires and that's cleaning and lubing your chain. Uh, if I've been riding a bike and I've kind of neglected that job for a while, I could start hearing the chain, not squeaking yet, but I can hear more vibration as it's rolling through the cogs. And when I lube the chain, I'll notice all of a sudden it's a lot quieter. And also my ride feels like it's maybe, I don't know, up to five miles an hour faster. That's an exaggeration, but I do feel more efficient after I lube the chain that's gotten kind of dried out. If you are hearing squeaking from your chain, you have waited way too long. I'm also gonna say as winter approaches, Keeping your chain maintained is uh, more important than even during the summer. Uh, if we get nor'easters, slush storms, snowstorms, sleet, ice, you know what goes on the ground in New York City. It's a lot of salt and sand. And after one or two rides, even a well lubed chain can start to get rusty. I have been on some rides like that and neglected my chain maintenance and came to discover that 
my chain was totally ruined and no amount of lubing it was going to unruin it, that the links had just gotten stuck from rust. So here's what you do. It's actually pretty easy and it doesn't need to be hugely messy. Well, first let's talk a little bit about some chain anatomy. We'll come back to this diagram. So your chain has about 144 of these, uh, depending on, well, that's not true, 144 pieces. I should actually probably research this better, but one link is an outer plate like this with two pins, two rollers, and an inner link. And then that connects to two more outer links, two pins, and two rollers. So if you get a little rust on your outer links, no big deal. Although if you keep your chain lubed, that's, that's not gonna happen. The part that really needs the lube is these rollers. So this is the moving part right here uh, where the roller and the pin connects one end of an outer link with one end of an inner link. So what do you need? You're gonna need a rag, obviously, and you can use old t-shirts, socks that get holes in them, anything you want. Um, I would not use your mom's nice towels for this. That would be a bad idea, bad relationship building. Uh, you're gonna need some sort of a uh, grease solvent. So if you go to Home Depot, you can get Simple Green. Uh, you can also get this citrus-based, it's biodegradable, made of a natural product, not that you want to drink it, but it's citrus-based solvent, that gets changed really clean, and it's not petroleum-based. Uh, there are petroleum-based stuff, like uh, mineral spirits or paint thinner is probably the best option there that will also get your chain really clean, but it also makes your house really smell. Uh, I've also used a spray bottle filled with water, but then I use massive amounts of Dawn dish soap. Uh, way more dish soap than I would ever use in my um, dishes for, you know, the kitchen. But simple green or an orange solvent is probably the best way to go. And then you're going to need some kind of a chain lube. And there's, I don't know if I go through this, there's a couple different ki kinds of chain lube. Um, there's wet lubes, some of which are thicker than others. I've used um, recently finish line wet lube and it was pretty thick and my chain just attracted dirt like a, like a magnet. Uh, normally I use this ProLink, which is thinner and it stays, uh, stays a little cleaner. Three in one oil is another option. It's kind of in its terms of its thickness uh, or TriFlow. Uh, both of them are kind of similar products that you can just get from a hardware store. Uh, ProLink is a bike, it's a bike product, but these two products, TriFlow 3-in-1, you can get from most hardware stores. Do not use WD-40. That is not a chain lube. It is way too thin. In a pinch, it'll do, but um, that's not a regular chain lube. The other type of chain lube is called a dry lube. Uh, people use that in dry, dusty, summery conditions, mainly for mountain bikes or bikes that are going to be maybe on like dusty trails. Uh, it's silicon based, so it keeps the chain lubed, prevents wear and tear, but it does not attract dirt near as much as these oil based lubes. I'm going to say you want it for an oil based lube, not go with something super thick like there's this Phil Wood Tenacious Oil. Uh, that stuff's really going to attract the dirt. I would go with a Pro Link or a Tri Flow or a three in one. Um, there's also wax based lubes out there, which are similar to oil wet lubes. I've used them before. Maybe I was doing it wrong, but I found that they created an unholy mess on my chain and my, my drive train. So I've stopped using them. Plus, I didn't think they lubed that well. Your results might be different. Uh, white Lightning is an example of a wax-based lube. I'm not talking about the Kentucky Moonshine, though, uh, an actual product called White Lightning. 
Now there are some tools that you can get to, um, they're chain cleaners, it's a little mechanical tool. You open the lid up, you pour some, some uh, your chain cleaner in there. You put the chain in so it's running through there and then you close the lid and run the chain through it. Um, I found these have mixed results and then it was another thing that I had to clean. So I just use a rag. Now what you want to do is uh, find an identifying length. There's a lot of um, bikes that now use KMC or Whipperman chains that have what's called a connecting link that will have a little slot where you know two ends of the chain connect. Shimano chains and I believe Campagnolo chains don't use that. What you can do is maybe just wipe off one link so it's cleaner than all the others or put a little bit of enamel paint or even fingernail polish on a non-moving part, maybe the end of the pin or the middle of the side plate. Um, that way you have an identifiable link. And what I do is I put that link just behind the chain ring or the crank set. And I start working backwards towards the back derailleur or the back wheel. And what I'm doing is I'm using my solvent. Uh, this is an orange cleaner. And I have my rag behind the chain and I'm spraying the solvent on the chain, but also on the rag. And what happens here when you do it this way is the rag keeps the solvent from spraying all over your carpet or floor or whatever, also all over the, the wheels and the bike parts. And so I'm just gonna spray this section down here. And then I'm gonna take the rag that has solvent on it and I'm gonna rub that chain down on all four sides, the top, the bottom and the side plates and try and get it as clean as I can. Uh, then I move to a different section of rag that doesn't have all that crud on it. And I rotate the cranks backwards so that my next section of chain comes in here. And I tend to work on the bottom side here, not, not the top up here. And I do that until my identifying link comes all the way back around. And I might clean some crud off of these pulleys right here on the sides of the pulleys. I might try and clean a little crud off of the teeth on the chain rings. I might polish up the, the crank arms a little bit or the derailleur with a clean rag, not the rag I was using to clean the chain with, or at least not the dirty part of that rag. Uh, just polish that stuff up while you're waiting because you're gonna need to wait for that degreaser to dry and evaporate. You don't wanna put fresh lube on the degreaser because one is working against the other. And then, you know, and that might be an overnight or it might just be an hour, uh, whatever I feel like. But then I take my bottle of lube and I, I don't buy aerosol bottles. You can't really control the flow on one of those steel can aerosol bottles. And it just tends to way over lube, spray way too much lube on your chain. You're getting it on your tires. It's splattering in your face and on your hands. These drip bottles are the way to go. And what you want to do is drip one drop of lube on the roller. And again, I start at my identifying length. This isn't a good picture, but I can see that it's, it's the master link for this chain and I work backwards. I'm, I'm doing the same direction that I did when I was cleaning it. So again, you're dropping that lube right here in the center of the roller. You don't need to get it all over the place because in the course of pedaling and shifting, the lube will distribute itself around the chain. Um, so how often do you do this? Uh, might want to just as a suggestion, once every 100 miles, once a week, 
it depends on how much you're riding in rain, snow, ice, wet conditions, sandy conditions. If you have a flat, a fat bike and you take that bike out onto the beach, I would suggest lubing your chain, cleaning and lubing it right away when you get home. Uh, wet, dirty, muddy conditions, dry, like dusty trail conditions, your chain is going to absorb that. That dust is going to absorb the oil. You're going to need to clean it and relube it. All right, let's talk about cables. So your cables, unless you have hydraulic disc brakes and electronic shifting on very expensive bikes, the cables run the brakes and the shifters and derailers. So your shifter is connected to the derailleur via a cable. And I don't know if I have, yeah, I do have a cable anatomy. So it's probably not the greatest picture, but here's an example of a cable that's running to a derailleur from the shifter. And in certain stretches of that, it's running through what's called housing. Anywhere where the cable has to make a turn, like from the shifter on the handlebar to the frame, it's going to be running through housing. For straight stretches, like along the frame, uh, it might be just bare cable. Now, more and more modern bikes, especially as they use hydraulic disc brakes, which are totally different, they don't involve a cable at all. The Bike manufacturers are just, they're setting up the frames so that you have a continuous run of housing from the brake lever or the shifter all the way back to the brake or the derailleur. And they do that so that they can use the same frame, but maybe upgrade the components for a more expensive bike. And instead of using a cable operated system, they use a hydraulic system. So what I'm gonna show you here, it, doesn't really work that well if the cable is entirely encased with housing uh, from the shifter and the brake lever to the brake and the derailleur. If it's 100% housing, you can't do this. All right, so you are probably gonna need uh, either a little bit of grease, and I like these tubes of grease from Park Tool. I believe other manufacturers also sell tubes of grease, but Park is, Pretty common brand. You can also use a grease gun. Uh, you can go to Harbor Freight and they have these grease guns and when the grease runs out it's just a tubular cartridge that you slide in there and you have to follow the directions to make it work right but um, they're probably a little more complicated to use than these tubes of grease. Uh, another way to go is uh, just using your chain lube as a cable lubricant. Here's another example. Again, see a run of housing here coming from the shifter, a run of housing here coming from the shifter, and housing coming from the brake lever down into a road brake. So what do you do? Assuming you have runs of bare cable, here's an example. Here's not an example. This is actually housing all the way here um, actually so but what you would do is put your chain on the largest cog you use your shifter and shift it to the largest cog in the back different bike and here you can see there's a run of bare cable that goes from this spot near the back derailleur and it will go all the way up to near the front of the bike. So I've shifted my chain onto this largest cog and then I use the shifter to release tension on the cable, but I'm not pedaling it because that will just shift the chain back down here to the smallest cog. I, that way I'm leaving the chain up here and it creates slack looseness in the cable. And again, I only do this on bikes where I have a, a run of bare cable. 
because that way I can pull the housing on a, out of its little stop right here. There's usually a slot in there that I can slide the cable through. And I can expose the cable that is running inside of this housing by sliding the housing forward now along the bare cable. And you can see here, same bike, I've got that cable exposed and I'm putting a little lube on there. You can also try and drip, drip some lube inside the housing. Now for the front on a road bike, you're not gonna be able to do this because the housing is kind of like taped underneath the handlebar tape. Um, but for a mountain bike, you would be able to because the housing just kind of comes out of the, um, the shifter uh, where and, and to where it joins the frame. And when I'm done lubing it, and I might even wipe it down with a rag before I lube it in case it's gotten some crud in there. Um, you know, and you want to just check the housing or the cable, make sure it doesn't have any kinks, check the housing, make sure it doesn't have any tears or bends in it, like a hard bend. That actually, a kink or a hard bend actually makes the cable uh, not slide so smoothly through the housing. Uh, if, if you do have kinks, fraying, uh, tears in the housing, it's probably time for a cable and housing replacement, which is a totally different job that we're not going to cover here. So what you do is you insert your housing when you're done lubing it back into the housing stop, which is this little piece that's welded to the frame. And there is a little slot there where the cable can kind of slide through and go through the slot there. Uh, shift your shifter back into the position where the chain is at and just test it and see if it's sliding any smoother. Um, the housing does wear out. There's like uh, a liner inside there and over many thousands of miles and hundreds and hundreds of shifts, the cable is gonna wear that out. So it's, you know, every few years is probably just a good idea to replace those. All right, our last repair job that is fairly simple or maintenance job is involves using the adjusting barrels. So the adjusting barrel, you can find those in different places on the bike. You will almost always find one on the rear derailleur, right where the housing and the cable go into the rear derailleur. I know I have pictures of them elsewhere. You probably won't find one on the front derailleur. You will often find them at the top of a road brake, a caliper brake like this. If you have cable disc brakes, you will find them an adjusting barrel where the housing goes into the disc brake. And then on somewhat olderish frames, you might find an adjusting barrel at the front of this little mount right here where the housing and the cable starts to go along down the frame. If you have um, mountain or hybrid type brake levers, let me just make sure I have a picture where I want it. Well, let's talk about derailers. So I've told you where the, the adjusting barrels will be at. They'll be at the back of the derailleur. They might be on the frame near the front of the bike, near the head tube, where the housing comes out of the handlebar and goes down the frame. Or you might have what's called an inline barrel adjuster. If you might notice as your housing comes out somewhere, maybe out of the shifter, that it has a fatter part, that's often an adjusting barrel. It does the same thing as this. So typically what happens if you just replace the cables or you have a new bike is that the cables themselves stretch, this housing compresses a little bit, things get seated a little tighter into the housing stops and into the shifter 
And all of a sudden that brand new bike after a few rides is not shifting the way it should be. With modern index shifting systems, especially for the rear derailleur, when you click the shifter once, it should shift very precisely and cleanly to the next gear. Um, but what happens is with most shifters, to shift to a bigger cog on the back wheel, that shifter is pulling cable. And it has to pull a precise amount of cable, a precise length. As the cable stretches and things get settled in, all of a sudden that length gets thrown off. You have more cable slack than when you bought the bike brand new. So how do you fix that? What you want to do is take this adjusting barrel and unscrew it like you're trying to take it out. But just a little bit at a time, unscrew it maybe half a turn and then test your shifting. The first time I tried messing with this on a, my first bike that had index shifting and index is where your shifter has one click and it shifts one gear. I totally messed it up because I was messing around with this adjusting barrel. I had no idea what it was doing. And I, I totally messed it up and had to take it back to the bike shop for a serious adjustment. But then I learned how to do it. And what I learned is that unscrewing it, in other words, turning this counterclockwise, half a turn, maybe even a quarter of a turn, and then testing it, you'll take out enough slack in the cable so that your shifting is nice and crisp again. So what it should do is shift pretty smoothly from these smaller cogs to the bigger ones. But you want to test it going back too, because if you overdid it and unscrewed that adjusting barrel too much, then the cable's too tight and it won't release enough cable. The shifter won't release enough cable to let the derailleur move back one gear at a time. Um, now, you're shifting for the front derailleur and the crank set if you have more than one gear there. Usually, does, often does not have an adjusting barrel. And what you have to do is put the chain in the smallest cog and just you know, pull on the cable and see if there's any slack. If there is slack, you have to loosen this with an Allen wrench or some whatever wrench your front derailleur uses. Loosen where the cable clamps into the derailleur, pull the cable tight, and then retighten that. It's, it's not as simple as using the adjusting barrel. All right, let's move on. Let's talk about brakes. So your adjusting barrel, as I mentioned, will be at the top of a road brake, at the front end of a disc brake, if it's a me mechanical disc brake. Um, if you have a road bike or, a, I'm sorry, a mountain bike or a hybrid, your adjusting barrel will be also on the brake lever. Uh, v brakes don't have an adjusting barrel at the brake. Uh, most cantilever brakes also don't have adjusting barrels at the brake. The adjusting barrel is right here on the lever itself. So what happens? I mean, you still get the same cable stretch issues, but also even if you're bike, you've had your bike a couple of years, your pads are gradually wearing out as you use the brakes. And so you'll have to pull the lever farther and farther to, um, compensate for your brake pad wearing out and, and gradually going away. But it's the same thing. You unscrew this part, the outer part of the adjusting barrel, and it will pull the cable tighter and your brake pads will get closer to the rim. And then it has this second part here, which is a kind of a little lock ring or a lock nut. And you want to screw that back against the body of the brake lever. That way it holds your adjustment in place as you're using the brakes and bumping over the trails and things like that. It's pretty easy to do. Uh, if you do replace your brake pads, and we're not gonna get into that tonight, all of a sudden now you have nice fat new brake pads that are 
a good eighth of an inch thicker than the ones you just threw out. And you're probably gonna have to screw this back in uh, so that you can get the wheel in uh, and everything will fit together correctly. So how do you tell? If, you're, if your brake lever is pulling too close to the handlebar, you cannot get your thumb between the handlebar and the brake lever when the brake lever is squeezed, then your brakes are pulling a little too close to the handlebar. And you need to just like uh, use that adjusting barrel. Uh, if, you, if the adjusting barrel is getting unscrewed way, way out there, you're probably gonna need to screw it back in and do an adjustment where the cable anchors to the brake itself. But if you're going to go that route, I would at that point check the brake pads to see how much wear they have. If there's no um, pattern left on the brake pads, or if they're less than one eighth of an inch of rubber left, then it's time to replace those. And that is the end, that is the end of our presentation. I am going to take a look. I saw some more comments coming into the co uh, comments. Thank you for staying with us. These are all, by the way, very easy jobs. The, the cable adjustment with the adjusting barrels is a little bit counterintuitive, but everything here is pretty easy. So. We have some pretty bad uh, bike malfunctions. Uh, two flat tires in one day, that's not fun. Bottom bracket disintegrating, that means you're probably walking or calling a cab. Sorry to hear about that one. Um, by the way, it's always a good idea to do an, what's called an ABC quick check before you go out on every ride. It, it's, you know, it's funny. I gone out on rides and I think I know my bike and all of a sudden I discover, hey, what the heck is this doing loose, like a brake lever or something. Um, so we have a video on our website, I believe the League of American Bicyclists also has a video on how to do an ABC quick check. It takes you 30 seconds, but it would discover something like your bottom bracket probably wearing out. Okay, I'm going to go through, um, I'm going to unmute, or I can't unmute you, but um, you can unmute yourselves after I do this. Uh, so now you should have the, the capacity to unmute yourself. So Amy R. asks, what are your thoughts about the little electric pumps, in particular ones where you can set a target pressure? And my thoughts, Amy R., is that I have no idea because I've never used one. Um, I think you can purchase them from auto stores and Amazon. Um, and you can try it. Now, my one thought is don't take that with you on your bike trip to depend on it. Because what if you have a really bad day or a bad week like I did, and all of a sudden your batteries are dead and you were in the middle of the Mojave Desert, 100 miles from any town. That's where you run a mechanical pump uh, that will always be able to provide you with, with air. Uh, as a home repair thing, go ahead and try it and see how it works. Let's see, Paul is asking, would dish soap work? If, I'm assuming for chain maintenance. Uh, I would not actually put straight dish soap on your chain because it can't evaporate, it gets sticky. Uh, water with a lot of dish soap, that water is gonna evaporate and the ingredients in the soap will uh, dissolve or work themselves out by having cut all the nasty grease that's in the crud that's on your chain. Uh, but straight dish soap, no, 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 because um, it, it just won't dry out and it'll get sticky. 
what was the name of that product you recommended for a degreaser? So uh, the green bottle was Simple Green and the orange stuff, it's a citrus based, it's made out of like orange oils or citrus oils. I cannot remember the name of that stuff, uh, but Home Depot has it. Uh, Citrusol. Here, I'll put it in here. Uh, let's see. Am I doing this right? Um, I'm not sure I can. Here we go. Sorry, while well, we have technical problems with chat, because I think I'm replying to Amy privately here. When I don't want to do that, I'll just try and put it in here. I'm not even sure Citrusol is around anymore, but um, yeah, that went to Amy privately. Sorry about that. I'm not figuring out how it's going to um, let me do that. Okay. Steve is asking regarding the barrel adjuster on the rear derailleur, do we rotate the barrel adjuster in the same direction? as the direction in the chain in which we want the chain to move. For example, to move the chain to a larger cog, smaller gear, do we rotate the barrel adjuster counterclockwise? Yeah, it's kind of a, the way you have it worded is, I mean, I think you have it right, but to move chains to larger cogs, which may not be larger gears because a gear is a mechanical concept, but a larger cog visually, you're always pulling cable with the shifter. And if the shifter is not pulling enough cable, you need to take some slack out of that cable. And the only way to take the slack out of the cable is to unscrew that adjusting barrel. And unscrewing most mechanical things means you're going counterclockwise. The thing is, is, is the way you've asked the question and confused me initially, is that the, the barrel adjuster is perpendicular. It's sitting at a different angle than the chain and the, the gears themselves. Uh, but turning counterclockwise takes slack out of the cable. All right. Steve is giving me advice on, the, on uh, how to reply to everyone, and I hope I can do that. Um, okay. Paul is asking, if I have a rim brake where one pad is closer to the rim than the other, is there a way to adjust them to be even? So generally, uh, Paul, the answer to that question is yes, but it depends on the type of brake you have. Um, if you have a really old school road bike, like really old, and it has a caliper brake, you'll see a spring behind the brake that goes out to both arms. And as it comes out of the center of the brake, each side does a little curly Q, a little 360 rotation, then straightens out and connects to the brake arm. And there's a special tool that you have to get to retension that spring correctly. If you have a road brake with a more modern, what's called dual pivot brakes, you will see on one side of the brake, there is a little screw. Uh, it, it, and it just seems like it's sitting there randomly. It's not the screw that holds the brake to the bike. It's not the screws that assemble the brakes together, don't mess with those. And it's not the screws that or bolts that hold the pads on. It's just a tiny little screw uh, on the front. On the front, I've always seen it on the left side of the brake. 
And I always forget which is which on those, but uh, messing around with that little screw, maybe like one rotation at a time, recenters the brakes. But the other thing to check is make sure your wheel is in straight. I, you know, I, this happened to me the other night. I was working on a bike and the bike was in a repair stand and I had the brakes centered and I put the wheel back in and I'm like, why are the brakes not centered? Well, when I locked the quick release for the brakes that the wheel itself was not centered. So what is it, I did just to check it is I put the bike on the floor, vertical straight upright. I reopened the quick release. But sure enough, the wheel pops back in the center and I close the quick release. That's an easy one. Now, if you have um, cantilever brakes, which are brakes with two arms, on each side of the fork in the frame, and they're joined by what's called a straddle cable. Those can be a little bit tricky. Uh, make sure that the pads themselves are adjusted evenly. There's a certain type of old pad that has a, just a post on it. It's not threaded. That if those aren't installed evenly, then the brakes aren't going to be engaging the rim evenly. Most of the time they're installed correctly though. Uh, with cantilever brakes and with V-brakes though, you'll often see, again, with the tiny little screws, a little screw on each side of the bottom of the brake where the brake is attached to the, the frame or the fork. And those screws adjust the tension on the springs. Uh, and messing with, well, sometimes those brake systems only have one screw on one side. A lot of them have a screw on each side so you can adjust each spring independently. Again, a little goes a long way. To add spring tension to one of those brake arms, you screw that little screw in, maybe one turn. To take spring tension out, to release spring tension so there's not too much on one side, you unscrew that little screw. We should probably have a whole uh, presentation here just on brakes. I like Steve's um, suggestion here. Don't get chain lube on the wheel's rim. Uh, this is why we use the drip bottle because uh, it really lets out only one drop at a time. You can also keep a rag between the chain and the rim. Uh, yeah, you don't want to be, you don't want to lubricate your brakes. That kind of undermines their purpose. All right, I think, I think that is it for questions and comments in chat. Uh, well, we have something here from Paul. I had another issue on the previous bike where the brakes were even, but when engaged, only one side of the brake moved to the wheel. So yeah, that's, that's the same problem I was just describing with the little screws. One, one side has more spring tension on it than the other side. And you have to either mess with the springs or mess with the screws that fine tune those springs so that you have even spring tension on either side. I mean, that can also be a wheel that's out of true, out of dish. Uh, if your wheel's not true, there'll be moments parts of the rim where the brakes are centered and then as the wheel ro rotates one side's out of balance and it's rubbing against the brake pad and it's going to look like the pads aren't engaging the, the brakes correctly uh, but that's a wheel problem and not a brake problem all right do we have any questions it is 704 we've gone uh, about an hour do we have any questions people want to ask verbally Sounds like no questions. I just wanted to say thank you. Well, thanks for joining us. And, uh, you know, working on your own bike is, is fun and uh, it gives you more sense of, you know, what, what's going on with your bike and, uh, you know, how to take care of it yourself. And 
right now bike shops are pretty crowded places, uh, well, busy places. And I've heard of like three month wait times for tune-ups or, tune or several weeks. So if you can fix little easy problems yourself and uh, or prevent easily preventable problems for, from arising by just doing some basic stuff, it saves you uh, trips to the bike shop, saves your bike from some downtime. That way you can ride your companion uh, as often as you want. If there are no further questions, uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us. You will get a recording of this video, um, of this, this class, and hopefully Chantal, who I think is doing this for us, um, will also send out links to some resources we have on our own website. Oh, I mentioned, I'm sorry, I said I was going to give give you some resources. And it looks like Steve beat me to it. Um, I, I learned bike maintenance from, well, from trial and error working on my own bike. But I finally, somebody gave me a bicycling magazine bike repair book. It was like an inch and a half thick. And there's lots of different bike repair books out there. Uh, if you don't have time for a book and you have a specific problem, I would look at Park Tool videos. Park Tool is the biggest tool manufacturer for um, bike repair. And they have a lot of really good uh, videos on YouTube. There's some other good uh, videos out there. And I always use YouTube when I have something going on that I don't have any idea what to do. Uh, there's also some pretty bad how-to videos out there. So make sure you're getting something from somebody reputable and certainly Park Tool is, is reputable and their videos are easy to follow. Um, so good luck with your bike repair tasks and your maintenance tasks. Uh, we'd love to get back to the point where you can show you stuff hands-on. We will have a fix-a-flat class, I think scheduled for next week. If you are interested in learning how to fix the most common bike repair problem, we'll be covering that uh, in the next two weeks. Have a good evening, everybody. Thanks again. Have a good week. Take care.